Hi, Plant Family. I'm Ali, and I want to welcome you to our online campus. If you're new and interested in getting connected with us, send us a quick message or fill out our Connect card on our website. We'd love to hear from you. As we get ready to worship today, I want to invite you to do three things. Engage, greet, and give. First, engage. Engaging with an online worship gathering is a unique experience, so here are a few ways we found to help get the most out of it. Be fully present. Put away your other devices and distractions. Get out your Bible and notepad and settle in. Worship. Don't just watch. God wants to meet us right where we are as we lean into his presence. So let's worship like he's right here with us in our homes instead of just listening to the music and message. Contribute. Take a minute to share what Jesus is teaching you. You can do this in the comments or reach out to a friend and just process God's invitations and challenges to you from today's gathering. Next, greet someone. Take a minute right now to say hello in the comments. Introduce yourself and where you are watching from. We have people connecting with us from around the world and we love seeing our online community get to know each other. Finally, give. We can't thank you enough for all those who have supported the work of the gospel through the Plant Church. As you give, you allow the work of the gospel to continue. We want to thank all of you who have given to the Plant Church, and we want to invite all those who haven't yet to give to the work of the gospel through our website, theplantchurch.org slash give. It's great to have you with us. Let's worship together. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. Nothing can compare to our living home. Your presence, Lord. And I've tasted and See of the sweetest to love when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Your presence, sing Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit.
sing, let us become, let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of, come on, sing that out. Let this be your prayer. Let us become more aware, more aware of your presence. Let us experience your glory, God. Let us become, let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience.
your family, and your children, and their children, and their children. May his favor go upon you for a thousand generations. And your family, and your children, and their children, and their children. May his favor be upon you for a thousand generations. And your family, and your children, and their children. The children, me is present, go before you and behind you and beside you, all around you and within you. He is with you, he is with you in the morning, in the evening, in your coming, in your going, in your weeping, in rejoicing. He is for you, he is for you, he is for you. Have you ever felt gypped from something? That promotion you wanted, that opportunity, and it always seemed like the person who deserved it the least got it? What about you constantly are always doing the right thing, but the person who always cuts corners gets to strive ahead of you? Or what about growing up in a family? It seems like that younger sibling who, who always was doing the wrong thing was always being pampered, and you the elder sibling who seemed to do everything right and for the approval of your parents always seemed to be looked down upon. Yes, you know where I'm heading. If you were here with us last week, you know that I am talking about the older brother, the older sibling in the parable of the prodigal son. Now, here's what we're going to attack today. We're going to attack two things. One, was this sibling justified for his actions? Or was there a lesson to be learned for the older sibling and a lesson that we are supposed to learn as well? Let's pray as we dive into studying the prodigals. Let's pray together. Father God, I want to thank you for this opportunity to jump into your scripture once again. I ask you that during this time, as we've already looked at the younger sibling, that during our time, as we look at the older sibling, that we would give you the opportunity to speak whatever lessons you want us to learn from that older sibling. I ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 15. And when you turn to Luke chapter 15, I'm going to do a very quick recap for you before we get to the situation of the older brother. Now here's how the parable began. The parable began that Jesus talks about this father, this wealthy man who had a great estate and had two sons, an older son and a younger son. The younger son went to the father and said, Father, I want my half of the estate. Give me what I believe I deserve. And for some bizarre reason, the father, who should have never granted this request, granted the younger son to have half of his estate, half of the inheritance. 
And so a few days later, it says that the younger son packed everything up and went to a distant land and spent his money living a wild lifestyle. And so the son took off to a distant land, everything that opposed the father, completely different culture, completely different belief systems, everything opposite the way that he grew up. He went and he lived there and he squandered his whole inheritance in a short period of time. We talked about a season, a period of time of fun, and that's what this young man had. But here's the truth. When the money ran out, so did the friends. And so this young son of his realized he was all by himself. He had no money, no place to stay, and he was starving, it says. He wasn't hungry, he was starving. And so he had to get a job. He wasn't able to work at the local coffee shop, and so he went to the local farmer, and the farmer put him in the pig pen a place that was so opposed to whatever the father would have ever thought his son would amount to. But yet, it was all he could do. And as he was working with the pigs, the farmer wouldn't even feed him, and this young man was starving. He came to a point, and he realized, he, it says in Scripture, he came to his senses. In other words, he, he awoken from a place of irrationality. He awakened from a place of irrationality, and he said, my father has so much. I need to go home and beg for forgiveness and not ask to be put in the same position I once was in, but rather just to be one of his servants. And he truly believed that his father would at least have compassion to make him a servant. And so he headed home. And as he headed home, his father was watching. His father was waiting. And when the father saw him from a distance, he ran to him. He embraced him. The son wasn't even able to get out the whole apology. And the father said, grab the robe, grab the sandals, grab the ring, grab the fattened calf. For my son who was dead is now alive. And I love what Jesus had said. He says in the parable, so the party began. And so as the party began, the father was ecstatic. But the question is, was everyone feeling the very same way the father was? Let's continue in the parable now, picking up on verse 25 through 28. Meanwhile, the older brother was in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house. And he asked one of the servants, what was going on? Your brother is back, he was told. And your father has killed the fattened calf. We are celebrating because of, the, of his safe return. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. And so this older brother, as he was left in the fields and was finishing up his day's work, he heard music and dancing. And if you've ever heard music and dancing from a distance, you know that there is a big, big celebration going on and as this older son the person who was overseeing the estate second in charge to the father he's thinking how is there a party going on because all the planning everything that happened on the estate not only went through the father but through the eldest son and he's thinking how did this get past me why are they celebrating who are they celebrating and so he was excited, but yet confused. And as he got closer to the house, one of the servants, he asked him, what's going on? And the servant said, your father's thrown a party because your brother has returned home. And all of a sudden, you can hear a change in the emotional state of the older brother. Now here's a reality. Unfortunately, others' decisions do play a role in our emotional and even spiritual state. Yes, people do affect us in ways that often we are unwilling to recognize. And so this brother, in a moment, became angry. He became infuriated by what was happening. 
And all of a sudden, all I can think about, and the only way that I can label this is that all his family baggage came to the surface. Now think about this. Remember the intro. Remember that person that, 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 beca- that you became gypped because of? Remember that, that, that younger si- sibling who was always pampered? Remember that, those people that always get ahead of you even though you do every right thing? Whenever those things happen, baggage comes up. And for this older brother, some family wounds, some childhood wounds come to the surface. Now think about this. This older sibling, this older sibling, all he could think about was how the younger brother, when he left, stole his father's attention. Think about this. The younger brother took something away from him, the inheritance that was supposed to be his as well. And this inheritance was now cut in half and having to, in some ways, start again. You can also see how this younger brother left an emptiness in the family structure and the older brother was trying to pick up the pieces. And once again, this younger brother had stolen the show. The one who least deserved now given the most attention. And all these wounds and all these frustrations begin to come to the surface. And now this young older brother was wrestling with the choices and decisions that the younger brother had made. Let's continue in the passage. It says here in verse 28 through 30, the older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him, but he replied, all these years I have slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to. And in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. And what we see here is all of a sudden, the, the brother speaks up. The brother who was, who was once the compliant child, because back then especially, the older sibling was the compliant child. The older sibling, especially the oldest male, was always sitting under the, the tutelage and authority of the father, realizing that he had the next place of power and authority in the family. And so everything that the father had told the older son to do, the older son would do it because he always wanted to not only make his father happy, but make sure all the father's estate was going in the direction how the father wanted it to go. And so all of a sudden, all of this anger and all this resentment and all this bitterness starts to brew up. And I can just picture the father thinking like, where is this coming from? And he just starts calling it out. In anger, he says, I have slaved for you. In anger, he points out that that your younger son not only took the money, but he spent it in every single way that you would never, ever agree with. The older son talks about how he has done everything right, and this younger son has done everything opposed to what the father expected of them both. And so the oldest even says this, you've never even given me a goat. And you, that choice animal, the one we were waiting for that really, really, really big celebration, you slaughtered it for someone who has wronged you. And for this older sibling. He could not compute what was going on in his head and his heart. And so he retaliates against the father. But watch what the father, but watch what happens. The father is about to speak to the son's heart. But I think oftentimes when we think about the parable of of the prodigal son, we, we oftentimes make this whole parable about the younger brother. 
We believe that Jesus is, is giving this parable to teach us about the younger brother, but, but that's not the case, what Jesus is trying to do. Matter of fact, in Luke chapter 15, Jesus gives three parables. One about a lost coin. One about a lost sheep. And one about a lost child. And the reason why he had given these three parables is because of the audience he was speaking to. Look what it says in verse 1 and 2 in chapter 15. Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people even eating with them. And so who was Jesus' audience? It wasn't this crowd of notorious sinners. It wasn't this crowd of tax collectors. It was a crowd of religious people that were frustrated at Jesus for how Jesus was spending his time, who Jesus was investing in, who Jesus was sitting down and celebrating. And in all of this, the Pharisees and religious leaders were getting angry because they believed that if the true Messiah, the true Yeshua, had come from heaven, he would have taken his time and he would have focused on the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. But instead, you see this, this God from heaven, God with us, spending time with who the Pharisees and religious leaders believed were the wrong people. And so here was Jesus' goal. To reveal the condition of the Pharisees and the religious leaders' hearts. And I think oftentimes when we think about the parable of the prodigal son, we, we, we think about that it's written to the wrong person. We think about the younger sibling, but actually Jesus was writing this for the elder brother. And so think about who then is the older brother. Let me tell you who that older brother is. The one who believes that their good works wins the favor of God. The person who believes that their moral excellence is sufficient. The individual who religiously, morally competes to get God's and others' approval. Not just God's approval, but others' approval. The one who gets angry, judgmental when others experience God's grace and favor over them. And then what about this one person? The older brother is that person who wants to see others punished even when true repentance is present. Jesus is revealing the religious leaders' hearts. My question to you is, as you have been a part of church and walking with Jesus, do you recognize any of the older sibling in yourself? Do you believe that your good works are sufficient for God? Do you try to prove yourself religiously, morally, to compete for God's attention and others' approval? Do you get angry when those who are once far from God come to Christ and it seems like they have this clean slate? Because if that is you, you are that older sibling. I want to give you a really interesting example. I read this from Tim Keller and he gives the example from the movie Amadeus. Antonio Saleri, who is a composer, was a man who was a God-fearing man. And he loved God. And this composer had said to him, himself, he, he, he said, I'm going to pray to God and give my whole self to God because if I give my whole self to God, God will bless me and he will make me famous. And so Antonio, what he had done is he had prayed and said, God, I give you my gifts. I give you my talents. I give you my morality. I give you my purity. I give you my celibacy. I give you my life on one condition. 
you make me famous. And all of a sudden, this famous musician steps out of nowhere by the name of Mozart. And we all know who Mozart is, and this is a true story. And Mozart was completely irreligious, far from God. And all of a sudden, Mozart gained gained the fame and prestige that, that this man Antonio wanted. And Antonio, his whole life was now centered on destroying Mozart. And I love what Tim Keller says. He says, while the Mozart of Amadeus is irreligious, it is Sarah the devout, who ends up in a much greater state of alienation from God. Do you know what this other composer did? He said, if God's not going to bless me, I'm going to run as far from God as possible. I'm going to do the complete opposite. Matter of fact, I'm not only going to act like Mozart, I'm going to be worse than Mozart, and I'm going to want to destroy Mozart. This one, instead of revealing the goodness of God, became that older sibling, resenting his heavenly father, and actually running to his own distant land. So let me ask you a question. Does your faith have contingencies? Do you make deals with God? Are there contingencies on what you do and why you do them? And I believe that that each one of us, each one of us is that older sibling at some point. I know for me that I've seen the older sibling in me and I've also seen the younger sibling as well. I've seen those seasons in my life when when I got mad at others, how God would bless them and it seemed like he wasn't blessing me as he blessed them. And honestly, I believed he should bless me even further. And I'd get angry and frustrated. Yes, I have had contingencies on God during different stages of my spiritual life until I come to a place of honesty with who I actually am. Until until I hear the Father speak to me as he spoke to the elder sibling. Verse 31 through 32, it says, His father said to him, Look, dear son, you have always stayed by me, and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day, for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he is found. And here is the father's plea. It wasn't even an invitation. It was a plea. He's saying, son of mine, who has never left my side, you have always been in the blessings that I have. You have always shared in the inheritance. You have always lived in the identity, not having to run far from me, but you've always stayed alongside me. Come, see See this brother of yours who was was lost, who we identified as dead, has come home and is alive again. The father pleads with him. The father's pleading with the religious leaders that they have already been exposed to God's blessings, yet they were unwilling to see it. He was pleading with them saying, Come, you are living the blessings of the father. Celebrate with me that these notorious sinners, these tax collectors who were once lost, once far from God, are now close and back home. And what's so frightening about this is we really don't know the end of the narrative. Jesus leaves it very open-ended. And I believe he does this very specifically because every Pharisee and religious leader that is listening to Jesus' teaching is going to have to make a decision. Am I going to recognize that I've been always living in the blessing and go celebrate with these individuals who were once lost but are now found? Or am I actually going to find myself in a deeper and darker place than these have ever gone. Plant family. I know it's easy for us to talk about the younger brother because of all the shame and the guilt that this 
this person put on themselves by, by bad choices. But what about this plant family? What about the person who's done everything right, yet with the wrong motives? What about that person who, who outwardly looks so spiritually fit, yet deep down their heart is dark and angry and bitter and jealous? And if you're that individual, only you will know how dark that place can be. So let me leave you with three things. How do we apply this, this older sibling? First, we need to ask ourselves, what is your inner motive? Why do you do what you do? What is your motivation that drives you into relationship with God and with others? I, I love what Tim Keller writes. He writes this. He says, he says, do you want to be in a relationship with Christ? To want to be in a relationship with Christ, we must not only repent of the things we have done wrong, the younger brother, we must also repent of the reasons we ever did anything right. Can I read that again? To want to be in a relationship with Christ, we must not only repent of the things we have done wrong, those, those grave things like the younger brother, but just as important, we must also repent of the things we ever did anything right. Do you do the right things with the wrong motives? Because if you do the right things for the wrong motives, it's no different than, the, than doing the wrong things with the right motives. What's your inner motivation? Second, even though we may be in the right place, we may be a long way from home. Even though we may be in the right place, going to church, going to life groups, being part of a missional community, playing in the worship band, being on a leadership team, maybe even being an elder, maybe even being on a staff, we may be a long way from home. As much as the elder brother was living under the father's roof, his heart was in a distant land. Even though he was living on the estate, his heart was completely somewhere else. Now listen to this. One brother fed on pods for pigs, but the other fed on unforgiveness, jealousy, and bitter resentment toward his brother and also his father. You may be in the right place, but your heart could be completely wrong. Are you living in a place of unforgiveness, jealousy, resentment, bitterness, and yet still doing the right things? Because if you are, there's a lesson to be learned from the older brother. And, he, and here's the last thing that I want you to chew on. Don't allow your ego to miss the party. Don't allow your ego to miss the party. Because what Jesus was saying through the example of the Father is, hey, eldest son, we are partying, we are celebrating what God is doing in others. Come, join us. You've been celebrating all along the way. Now, that one who was far from us, far from home, ran away, spiritually, emotionally, relationally dead, is now alive. Come and join the party. And all I can hear the Father say is, don't allow your ego to miss the celebration. Have you allowed frustration towards others and anger towards God to be part of the work that God is doing right in front of you? Are you allowing circumstances or events that haven't played out the way that you want them to, to keep you from experiencing the fullness and the blessings of God. Because if you are allowing your ego to not see the things that God is up to and, and wanting you to participate in, then you are also that elder brother. So again, what's your inner motivation? Two, 
does your heart reflect in the place where you live? And three, have you allowed your ego to not see the things that God is up to? And has your ego kept you from experiencing all the blessings that God is doing in others? Plant family, as we go to this song in worship, I address you, that elder brother, that other prodigal. Come home. Leave your ego. Leave your frustration and your anger and your jealousy and your unforgiveness. Leave your wrong motivations at the foot of Jesus. Come home, prodigal. Come home. Let's worship together. You can have it all, Lord. Every part of my world. Take this life and breathe on this heart that is now yours. You can have it all, Lord. Every part of my world Take this life and breathe on This heart that is now yours Oh, the joy I found So the feet of the King who surrendered everything and oh the peace that comes when I'm broken and undone by your
this heart that is now yours. Let me pray for us. Father God, I have said this last week and I say it again. I believe understanding and grasping this parable is one of the most important truths for all of us to grasp. Yes, last week we we learned about the rebellious younger brother. But today we learn about why Jesus gave this parable. For the person whose motivations are wrong. For the person whose spiritual ego has stood in the way for that person who may be doing all the right things, but their heart is actually in a distant land. Holy Spirit, bring healing and invite that child home. That they would recognize that they have been living in the blessings all this time. I ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Plant family, I want to challenge you. Deal with the motivations of your hearts. Deal with your ego so that you can experience the full blessing of living in relationship with Jesus and being a part of the kingdom of God. And remember this, we are praying with you and we're praying for you. Have a great day.